Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. We begin our celebration of the 70th anniversary of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. It's also the start of our listener support campaign, though we'll probably play to that a bit less this week than we normally would, so we can focus more on the anniversary. However, you can support the show on a one-time basis, support.greatdetectives.net. Send a donation with the Zell app to box13 at greatdetectives.net. And also, you can mail in your support to uh, Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715, or become one of our ongoing Patreon supporters for as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Now, during the course of this week, we'll be sharing an interview with John C. Abbott, author of the Who is Johnny Dollar Matter. Uh, We will go ahead and play the first portion of that interview with the rest of the interview being played after each uh, program this week. So let's go ahead and we'll take a listen. All right. Well, we have uh, John Abbott with us. He is the author of the Who is Johnny Dollar Matter, which is now in its second edition in two volumes. So could you tell me what uh, made you decide to write a nearly 1,400-page book in two volumes about yours truly, Johnny Dollar? Well, originally, I was just going to write a biographical piece about the uh, the character, Johnny Dollar. And this was way, way back in uh, 1999. Uh, but uh, things kind of got out of control. And I just realized after writing a, par- a page and a half that there was more to be written about Johnny Dollar. So I just started listening to each and every program that I could find documenting the contents of the programs, you know, the directors, the expense accounts, staff, uh, you know, staff and uh, the cast, and it just kind of snowballed. And I really wrote as much as I wrote because at the point in time when I started this, the quality of the uh, uh, programs was a lot worse than it is now. And so uh, I had programs that I would literally have to listen to five and six times to uh, understand what was going on. And you know, like I say, it ended up in a uh, a nice doorstop. From Hollywood, it's time now for Bob Bailey as... Johnny Deller. Fred Wilkins at Northeast and Fidelity, Johnny. Oh, hi, Fred. I got a case for you. Remember the Alvin Summers embezzlement? Sure, he took off with 75,000 bucks about six months ago. Right. We held a bond on him, so we're stuck with it. So? This morning, a guy called from a little town on the west coast of Mexico, Santo Tomas. It was a bad connection, but I gathered he had some information on Summers and wanted somebody to go down there and talk to him. I nominated you. Then he's expecting me, huh? What's his name? I don't know. Well, how do I contact him at Santo Tomas? I'm afraid I don't know that either. You mean I'm supposed to go looking for somebody whose name I don't even know? How come he's so coy? I don't think it's a case of being coy, Johnny. Before we could get very far into the conversation, the connection was broken off at his end. Okay, Fred, I'm on my way. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Alvin Summers matter. 
Item one, $220. Plane, train, and boat fare to Santa Tomas, Mexico. For a town trying to be a resort, Santa Tomas shouldn't be so hard to get to. The last lap was by far the worst. A creaky, twice-a-week boat from Mazatlan. And I may be wrong, but it looked to me like the only outfit interested in making a resort out of Santa Tomas was the big new hotel up on a cliff overlooking the sea, the Playa del Mar. The rest of the town just didn't seem to care. It was a sleepy fishing village. A dilapidated pier, a long curving beach with the jungle crowding in on it, and a miscellaneous assortment of adobe shacks huddled here and there, sort of digging their feet into the ground. Even at a distance, the Playa del Mar looked too rich for my purpose, so I checked in at the other hotel. It was an old two-story job in town that I found after carefully detouring around a belligerent rooster scratching up a meal in the street outside. Once inside, I couldn't help feeling that the rooster was better off. It was small, dingy, and hot. I signed the beat-up ledger that passed for a register, and a little character wearing a ragged shirt with no collar, a big grin, and a baseball cap swooped down on me and grabbed my suitcase. Right over the stairs, senor. Okay. Are you the star of the Santa Tomas Nine or something? Okay. The baseball cap. Oh, it's a first-class hotel here. I got to wear a uniform. Oh, sure. Silly of me. Uh, which way? Uh, follow me, senor. Uh, you come here to fish? Not exactly. My cousin has a very good boat to hire a cheap. Sorry. Oh. Well, if you're here on just a vacation, I'll be glad to show you the scenic sights for a very small fee. Hey, look, promoter, before you start making a career out of me, how about showing me my room? Okay, okay, senor. Here. It's a very nice room, no? Oh, sure. Hey, uh, look, can we get a little air in here? Oh, see, si, I turn on the overhead fan. It's better, no? No. There's a balcony out here? Oh, see, si, with a beautiful view of the ocean, Senor Dollar. Beautiful. The only thing I can see is the wall of that building across the alley. Ah, but if you climb up on the railing and stand in the corner and look over the roof of the building, there in the distance you see the... Beautiful. Be- look, um... Uh, Benito, senor. Benito, I gather that in addition to a few other assorted enterprises, you're the bellboy in this establishment. I do everything. Well, it must really be a strain. Oh, see, I'm always a straining. Been in Santa Tomas long? Si, senor. Too long. Have you heard my name mentioned around town lately? Anybody asking for me? No, senor. Holy rat. Oh, the door to the balcony. Oh, it's nothing, senor. Only the fan. Why? Well, when the fan is on, the door, it blows shut. You're jumpy, senor. Huh? See, you are jumpy. Yeah, well, I'm in a good business for it, but, you know. Tell me, did you ever hear the name Summers? Summers? Senor, in Santo Tomas, is always Summers. Okay. I mean a man named Summers. Alvin Summers. Here's his picture. Take a look. Hmm. Ever seen before? Senor, in this heat, it's a strain to use the memory. Yeah, well, you, uh, you think this might make you forget the heat? Quien sabe, Senor Dollar. It might help. Here. Oh, Five dollars, American. Gracias. Now, how about it? Si, senor. I have seen this man. Here in Santa Tomas? I think so. Where? How long ago? I don't remember, but I'll try to find out for you. Okay, Benito. That bill I gave you, I've got a few more just like it, if you can locate the guy in this picture, Alvin Summers. Or if you can find anybody who's asking about me. Senor, for that kind of money, I'll not only find him, I'll bring him to you on a silver planter. Item two on expense account, $5 American to Benito the bellboy. Flying blind the way I was in this deal, I figured I needed all the help I could get. And who knows, Benito just might turn something. After he left, I stretched out on the rickety bed and tried to figure out a plan of operations. I had to make myself conspicuous if I wanted the man who'd called the home office to contact me. On the other hand, if Alvin Summers himself was in the vicinity, I'd have to be pretty inconspicuous to stand a chance of getting anywhere near him. Trying to do both at the same time might not be exactly easy. Yeah? Dollar? 
Well, yeah. Who are you? Carson's the name, E.K. Carson. And I'm sure glad I found you, friend. Hey, you the guy who telephoned and wanted to see me? I sure am. Well, my luck seems to be holding up pretty well. Not too well, I hope. <laughs> huh? Yes, sir. As soon as I saw you check in, I phoned a desk clerk to ask who you were. I says to him, he looks like an American to me. See, I'm in room Wait a 10 minute. downstairs. Uh, desk clerk? I thought you meant that long-distance call. Well, the hurt. reason I hope your luck's not too good, friend, I'm sure hoping to get you into a little cribbage game. Cribbage? You play, don't you? No, I'm strictly the gin rummy type. Oh, I could teach you, friend. Wouldn't take a jiffy. Uh, sorry, I thought you were somebody else. Oh, I... I sure wish I could get you into a little game, friend. Gets mighty lonesome making arounds of these small towns. Are you in business here? No, I'm a traveling man. Regional sales manager for hold tight zippers. Zippers? Down here? Sure thing. All a matter of education. As I often say, business is where you find it. Why, half the world is just waiting to be zipped up. Great thought, ain't it? Terrifying. Uh, look, Mr. Carson, if you'll excuse well, what me... What about that cribbage game, friend? Sorry, as I told now, you, Now, I'll I... bet if you just learned to play the game, you'd find out it was a whale of a lot of fun. I'll wait. Well, then, why don't we have us a good talk about business? Look, if you don't mind, I've got a few things to do around oh, here, so... Sure, sure, I know. To tell you the truth, I guess I'm just plain lonely. Daytimes aren't so bad when I'm out on the road, but... Nights, I don't seem to be able to find anyone to talk to. Now that you're yeah, here... Yeah, well, uh, maybe we can have a drink sometime. Say, I'd sure like that. Then maybe we can get up a little game later. Well, maybe. I ushered E.K. Carson, the cribbage king, politely but firmly out of the door. I'd figured him for the man who wanted to talk about Alvin Summers. But all he apparently had on his mind was cribbage and zippers. I ambled on downstairs into the cantina next door. I cut my way through the smoke to the bar and looked around. A few tired-looking characters at the tables, and over in one corner, a little fellow bent over a guitar, eyes closed, and a world all his own. Then I saw the girl. Three stools down the bar from me. But when I looked up again after a drink, she was only one stool away. Hi. Hi. Welcome to Santa Tomas. Thanks. Really something, isn't he? Hmm? That guitar player. I saw you watching him. Oh. You know, those guys give me the creeps. They start playing and all of a sudden they're gone. Real far away. I don't think he even knows there's anybody else in here. Lucky man, huh? Yeah. It's funny. A cheap run-down bar like this. Nobody listening to him. Except us. And he's playing like he's on a cloud. Yeah. There's a flamenco singer like that up at the hotel that night out on the terrace when she starts those wailing songs of hers. She gives me the creeps, too. Up at the hotel, the Playa del Mar? Yeah. Oh, you must be down here to see how the other half lives. Mm, you mean to see if anybody lives in this town. I sure picked me a great spot for a vacation. Pretty dull, huh? Real. At least... It has been. Oh? Say, uh, do you know that guy over there? The American at the corner table? Yeah, the muscle man. I sure don't. You, uh, certain? Of course I am. Why? Well, he's been staring at us. Oh. Never saw him before, huh? Mm -mm. Of course, I've never been in here before. Maybe he's the bouncer. He sure looks like he could qualify. Well. Look, he's leaving. Yeah. I guess we made him self-conscious. I... Guess I'd better leave, too. Where to? Uh, Gloria. Johnny. Johnny. I think I'll go back up to the hotel and change. Then what? I don't know. There's a moon tonight. Got a date? Mm-hmm. Me? Mm-hmm. When? On the terrace. Half an hour. She left, and I sat there a drink or two, thinking her over and wondering what her angle was. I was pretty sure she was interested in me for more than my manly charms. And it occurred to me that it might not be too unpleasant finding out what was on her mind. Especially if it could help me locate an embezzler named Alvin Summers. I went up to my room to change. When I got there, I found I had company. Close the door. Well, my friend from the bar downstairs. I said close the door. Okay. Why the gun? Turn around. Face the wall. Okay. Hands against the wall. Hey, look, what are you... Shut up. Well, if you're looking for my gun, it's under my left arm. Thanks. 
Now turn around. So what's this all about? That's just what you're going to tell me. What's your name? Johnny Dollar. I'll bet. Cross my heart. We'll try again. What's your name? I told you, Johnny Dollar. You can think of a better one than that. Wise up, Buster. It sounds so phony, it's got to be legitimate. And speaking of names, what's yours? I'm asking the questions. You're answering. Okay, we'll play it your way. What are you doing down here, Dollar? Look, I'll make a deal with you. You tell me why you want to know, and maybe I'll be... Don't play games with me, Dollar. Next time you get more than the barrel of the gun. Hey, look, I don't know what this is all about. Okay, we'll... Cut out the question and answer routine. I know why you're here. Oh? So forget it, Dollar. Drop the whole thing and beat it. Maybe I'll like it around here. Oh! Oh! Touch, you won't like it around here anymore, Dollar. You'll learn to hate it. You and that gun put up a pretty convincing argument. I'll give it to you once more, Dollar. Slow and easy so you can get it this time. Go on away. Don't ever come back. If you don't go now, you won't ever go. Johnny Dollar. Where have you been, Johnny? I thought we had a date. Oh, Gloria. I'm sorry, baby. I've already had a date. What? Remember the big gorilla at the corner table downstairs in the cantina? The one who kept staring at us? Sure. What about him? Well, he was waiting for me in my room just now. He didn't like the way I parted my hair, I guess, so he changed it with a gun barrel. Johnny, are you all right? Uh, Aside from a lump or two, sure. Sounds to me like you need a little nursing, Johnny. I always do. It's beautiful out on the terrace tonight. Santo Tomas, Mexico. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Alvin Summers embezzlement case. (laughs) Item 4, $3 American to Eduardo Moreno, M.D., the doctor who dressed the assorted lumps and bruises I'd collected from the strong arm who seemed quite convinced that I should leave town. For a moment, I'd figured he could be the man who was to contact me with information as to the whereabouts of Alvin Summers, the embezzler. But as it turned out, all he wanted to say to me was goodbye, and he said it very convincingly. But Gloria was waiting for me. She definitely seemed to want to get better acquainted. And although I didn't know what her angle was, I figured it might be fun finding out. I left the joint where I was staying and went up to the Playa del Mar, the big expensive hotel overlooking the sea. There was a terrace with some tables and a flamenco singer wailing at the moon. Gloria was at one of the tables. Hi. Johnny, what in the world happened to you when I talked to you over the phone? I'm sorry I'm late, Gloria. You can see by my face I ran into kind of a rough detour. You all right now? Yeah. Johnny, you said it was that man who kept staring at us in the bar where we met? That's the one. Real charming fellow. Muscles, too. What happened? I went to my room to change before coming up here. He was waiting for me, worked me over. The general idea was I should leave Santa Tomas in a hurry. But why? I don't know, yet. But somewhere along the line, I'm going to make it a point to find out. Cigarette? Thanks. Well, looks like things are picking up a little. How so? I told you I'd found this place pretty dull so far. But now, with you getting beat up and told to get out of town, it's beginning to sound a little more interesting. Well, I could do with more dullness and a few less bruises, believe me. You must be down here on a lot more than just a vacation, Johnny. Oh, I don't know. A lot of people apparently come down here to this town just for a vacation. That's why you told me you came here, remember? There's only one difference. What's that, Gloria? I really am on a vacation, and I don't think you are. Oh? You're not the Santa Tomas type. Why not? Mexico City, maybe. Havana, maybe. But not Santa Tomas. No, I think you came down here to meet somebody. Or to find somebody. Okay. Suppose I did. Who would I be looking for? If you don't know, how would I? Looking for, uh, you, maybe? Oh, now that's the nicest thing that's been said to me all day. If you are, it's too bad I didn't know it sooner. Why? It would have made this town a little more bearable. Waiting. Or maybe you've been looking for me. Let's not be blunt here. I thought I was being so subtle. 
You have been looking for me? Well, I must admit I've been looking for someone who's alive in this town. Of course, what I should say is that I've always been looking for you, that I... Okay, okay. I guess that leaves me right where I started from. Hmm? Skip it. So, we're just two happy people on a vacation. Yeah. Okay, Johnny. Okay. Hey, that music. That the flamenco singer you were telling me about? Mm Mm-hmm. Sounds pretty weird, doesn't she? But I like it. You know something? Mm Hmm? Sounds even weirder from down below on the beach. Oh? Like to see for yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I think I'd like to. Well, give me a minute. What's the matter? Speaking of people staring at you... That guy again? Where is he? No, it's a little man this time. Over at the end of the terrace, see? Hmm? Oh, that's Benito. Who? The bellboy at my hotel. Hey, excuse me a minute. Be right back. Sure. Senor Dollar. Hiya, Benito. The desk clerk told me you'd come up here. What's on your mind? You told me you'd pay me money if I could get some information for you. That's right. I want to know if anybody's been trying to contact me. You turn up anything? Not about that, senor, but the picture you showed... The one of Alvin Summers? See, I told you I thought I'd seen him here in Santo Tomas. Now I'm sure of it. Good boy. Tonight I talked to a friend of mine. I described senor Summers to him. He told me he used to work for him as a houseboy. Good. Did he tell you where Summers is now? No, he could not tell me that. Couldn't or wouldn't? I do not know, senor, but he tell me where the house is that Summers lived in. Where is it? You could not find it, senor. It's in from the beach in the jungle a little way. I would have to take you there. All right, let's go. Well, not now. I'm uh, supposed to be on duty back at the hotel. I, I must get down there at once before the hotel clerk finds out I'm gone. When do you get off duty? At midnight. I'll come to your room then and... Take you to Senor Somers' house. Okay, midnight. Good boy, Benino. Uh, <clears throat> a real good boy, Senor? Mm. Oh, yeah. Here. Oh, gracias, Senor. Mm. <laughs> but uh, you should not have come here. Now, look, I've already had one guy tell me to leave town tonight. Don't you start? No, I mean you should not have come here to the Playa del Mar. Oh, why not? Because after you pay your check here, senors, you'll not have any more money left to pay me with. <laughs> well, don't worry about it, Benito. I'll bully you through somehow. See you later. Si, sí, senor. Well, hello, Dollar. Oh, no. Carson, E.K. Carson, remember? Sure, the zipper salesman. What brings you up here? Oh, same thing as you, friend, out doing a little stepping. I thought you told me down at the hotel that you figured half the world was just waiting to be zipped up. How can you afford to take the time off? All work and no play, friend. Haven't you heard? Yeah, well, I, uh, I I have a date. See you later, Carson. I'm still waiting to get you into a cribbage game, friend. Good. That's just what you do. You mean play cribbage? No, I mean keep waiting. When I got back to the table, Gloria was gone. I looked around, no sign of her. This I didn't get, and I didn't like. Why would she pull a disappearing act on me now? Johnny... Then I spotted her, just off the terrace on the path that led to the cabanas on the beach. I went over. She was carrying a scarf and wearing a one-piece bathing suit. The scarf looked bigger. Hi. Well. I thought as long as we were going down to the beach, we might as well go for a swim. Why not? Be right with you. Item five on expense account. Seven dollars for one pair of swimming trunks. Five for the trunks and two bucks to get the hotel shopkeeper out of bed to sell them to me. After all, I figured I ought to stay close to Gloria. That's the way she seemed to want it, and I wanted to know why. She could have some information on the whereabouts of Alvin Summers I could use. Well, she might. Oh, Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Come on, there's a place over against the rocks at the foot of the cliff. Okay. What do we do now? Build a fire and roast marshmallows? I'm sorry, I didn't bring any marshmallows. Oh, it's just as well. I'm strictly the hot dog and beer type anyway. Here we are. This is my place, Johnny. I come down here almost every night. That's nice. I told you there was a moon tonight. Yeah. And the flamenco singer. Music comes right down the rocks to us. 
Doesn't she ever get tired? Doesn't seem to. What's she singing about? Do you know? Uh-huh. It's about a man in jail in a little town. His sweetheart tosses a rose to him through the bars. It drives him crazy. <laughs> Cheerful. There aren't any walls around you, Johnny. Oh? Uh-huh. The only trouble is... I don't have a rose. Well, who needs a rose? Oh, Johnny. Darling. Gloria, look, I... You were saying... You know something? I forgot what it was. Good. Let's keep it that way, darling. Hold it. So who's thinking of moving? Shh. What is it? They're in the moonlight coming along the beach. Two men? Yeah. Take a good look at the one in front. Johnny, yeah. it's the... Yeah. The one who worked me over in my hotel room tonight. And it looks like he brought along a stooge with a machete. They're looking for you. Look, get around behind the rock here, then back up the path to the hotel. No, Quiet, Johnny. Quiet, get going. I'm not going to leave you. Please? please, Johnny, please, don't go out there. Now stay out of sight. They can't see us here in the shadows. Gloria, sooner or later I got a little matter to settle with that big ape. It might as well be sooner. No, please, I, I don't want you to get hurt again, Johnny. I'm not going to leave you. you. Okay, okay, come on. Let's shift around to the other side of this rock and keep it quiet. Can you see them? Keep your head down. Maybe it's farther up the beach. Now watch the water. That was close. Too close. Yeah. Johnny, are you in some kind of trouble? Not yet. You seem pretty concerned about me. I am. You sure that was why you didn't want me to tangle with him? Of course. You don't know the guy, huh? I told you I didn't. Why? Oh, I was just wondering if maybe he was a friend of yours and didn't want me moving in on him. Johnny, you're... You're talking crazy. I've never seen him in my life before today in the bar of your hotel. I told you I didn't want you to get hurt again. I mean it. I... Maybe this will prove it. Well, that's a pretty strong argument. Look, Gloria, I hate to, believe me, but I've got to leave. What? Must be almost midnight. So? So there's something i got to take care of. Oh, fine. I know. I'm sorry. Pretty strange vacation you're on, Johnny. Yeah. So, my timing was terrible. But I had to meet Benito the bellboy in my hotel room at midnight to find out more about Alvin Summers' whereabouts. I walked Gloria back up to her hotel and headed for mine. It was a couple of minutes after 12 when I got there. I walked into my room and started to reach for the light switch. Then I froze. The moonlight was streaming in through the louvered door to the balcony, and I could see a silhouette against it. Somebody was out on that balcony, crouching against the door. Slowly, carefully, I eased over to it, then suddenly jerked it open. Bonito. And I knew I wasn't going to get any more information about Alvin Summers out of him. After all, you can't do much talking when your throat's been cut. Johnny Dollar. This is Lieutenant Gomez of the Santo Tomas Police Department. Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. I have been trying to reach you for some time. Sorry, I was out making some funeral arrangements. It is about the dead man that I wish to speak to you, senor. Fire away, Lieutenant. What's on your mind? Precisely the question I was about to ask you. What do you mean? Surely I do not need to remind you that Benito Escanza was found dead in your hotel room earlier this evening. You certainly don't. But I've already told one of your cops the whole story. Perhaps... Perhaps not. I suggest that you come to see me so that we can discuss it further. Is that an invitation or an order? Uh, let us call it an invitation. But if you do not accept, we will have to come and get you. Santo Tomas, Mexico. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Alvin Summers $75,000 embezzlement case. 
Item six, $25 American. Funeral and burial expenses for Benito the bellboy. Somebody had to do it, and he apparently had no family. After I made the arrangements with the town's undertaker, I went back to my room and received Lieutenant Gomez's polite but firm invitation to drop in on him. So I went on down to police headquarters. Sit down, Senor Lola. Thanks, Lieutenant. So? So, the autopsy has confirmed the fact that Benito Escanso died from knife wounds. I didn't need an autopsy to tell me that. It was obvious. But what is not obvious is your part in all of this. Look, the story hasn't changed a bit since I told it to your Sergeant Romero. I went back to my room at midnight. I opened my balcony door and enrolled Benito. His throat had been cut. That is the story. As to what is behind the story, that may well be another matter. For instance? For instance... In a case such as this, everyone is a potential suspect. Everyone, including you. Isn't this being pretty ridiculous, Gomez? Is it? Then perhaps you would be kind enough to tell me if there was some legitimate reason Benito had his throat cut in your hotel room. Well, in the first place, if you're interested in alibis, I've got one. Indeed? Indeed. I was with a girl named Gloria Harris up at the Hotel Playa del Mar all evening. You can check that. Oh, you may be quite certain that I am checking on all your activities this evening, senor. In the second place, if you're interested in motives, I don't have one. No? Why would I want to kill Benito when I was hoping to get some information from him? Information of what sort, senor Dollar? Oh, I guess I'd better start at the top, Lieutenant. Here's my card. You are an insurance investigator. That's right. About six months ago, a man named Alvin Summers up in the States embezzled $75,000 from the company he worked for. The outfit I'm representing in the deal wrote the bond on him, so they were stuck for the money. $75,000. A couple of days ago, they got a long-distance phone call from down here in Santo Tomas. The man who called claimed that he had information about Alvin Summers. That's why I came down here. Now, who was the man who telephoned? We don't know. I came on the chance that he might contact me here, or that I might get some kind of lead on Alvin Summers' whereabouts. And have you? No, on both counts. Benito said he knew about a place where Summers used to live. He was going to take me there tonight. But apparently somebody had other ideas. And a knife to back them up. I see. And uh, nobody has tried to contact you? Oh, sure, sure. Several people have. But always for the wrong reason. First, there was a man named Carson, a zipper salesman. He contacted me for the purpose of setting up a cribbage game. Cribbage? What is this cribbage? Oh, now, that's something I hope I never find out. Hmm? Then there was a strong arm who bounced me around with a gun barrel and suggested politely that I wanted to leave town. Oh? Uh, what did he look like? Well, he was heavy in the shoulders, thick neck, low forehead, short dark hair, scar over the bridge of his nose. Scar? That would be Senor Kraus. You know him? I know him by sight. Well, who is he? What's his pitch? That is something I do not know. Senor, you must understand that Santo Tomas is a rather strange town and a dangerous one. Come in. Hey, Lieutenant. Oh, can't you see that I'm busy, Sergeant Romero? A body is about, Senor Dollar. Oh. Well, uh, what is it? Well, I have talked to a Senorita Gloria Harris at the Hotel Playa del Mar. She said that Senor Dollar was with her throughout the evening. <laughs> Very well, Romero. Uh, one thing more. We have just arrested a man, an uh, American tourist, uh, uh, Senor Carson. I will talk to him when I have time. Hey, wait a minute. That's the zipper salesman I was telling you about. Indeed? Yeah. Hey, look, maybe he ties into this deal after all. What's the charge? Romero? Uh, it's uh, disturbing the thief. Oh, great. Just when I thought I had a lead. What's the matter? He got a few too many under his belt, maybe? Well, Romero? Uh, here, here's the report. The Senor Carson is outside. Gracias. That will be all. Uh, I will talk to the man. Si, Lieutenant. Senor Donald, if you know this man, perhaps you had better come with me. Okay. Dollar! Say, I'm sure glad to see you. Hiya, Carson. What seems to be the trouble? Well, it, it wasn't as much as they made it, Dollar. A fella goes out stepping. Sometimes he, well... Well, you know. Yeah, he steps a little too far. Well, I was only having a little fun. Senor Carson, this report states that you are at the Hotel Playa del Mar this evening. Uh, that's right. But now, Lieutenant... It further what... states that you became increasingly noisy and that at one point, during a dance by an entertainer, 
You grabbed this seraptive from one of the musicians and attempted to join in the dance. Now, now, Lieutenant, maybe I was a little out of line, but I... Further, that when the dancer refused to dance with you, you chased her around the patio several times. Trying to sell her a zipper, maybe? Oh, no, Dollar, let up on a guy, will you? And that finally, when the musician attempted to get his seraptive away from you, you broke his guitar over his head. Say, when you get going, you're a real tiger, aren't you? Are these things true, Senor Carson? Well, I, I suppose the facts are correct, but they sound different somehow down here. I was just trying to have a little fun, you know. See, uh, Sergeant Romero will conduct you to the magistrate. Romero! A dollar, you're just going to stand there and not do anything? After all, we both live at the same hotel, and... And? And? Oh, you're a big help. What'll happen to him, Lieutenant? Well, you will have to pay the damages, and there will be a fine. Which will probably go on his expense account. Lieutenant, you started to tell me about this Beetlebrow Kraus who put a few dents in me. I started to say that before the people from Mexico City built the new hotel, this town unfortunately used to be something of a haven for undesirable characters from the United States. Fugitives, huh? Some of them still remain. And although I know very little about Senor Kraus, it is probable that he is one of them. Could be. You say that he and Senor Carson are the only ones who have made any effort to contact you? Yeah, except for Gloria Harris, of course. I still haven't found out what's on her mind. Hmm? I mean, what else is on her mind. She says she's down here on a vacation. Indeed. In that case, it has certainly been a long vacation. What do you mean? She's been here for several months, to my knowledge. Well, well. Now, that's very interesting, Lieutenant. Thanks. Anything else you want to ask me about, Benito? Uh, not at uh, the moment, but I suggest you remain available. You know where to find me. One moment, Senor Dollar. Hmm? A uh, word of warning. As I told you, this town can be a dangerous place. I would suggest that you be quite careful. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one thing I wish to impress upon you. If you are at any time tempted during your investigation to take the law into your own hands... I assure you that you will regret it. Well, in that case, I hope you're around when and if I need you. Whether or not I am available, the warning still applies. Okay. Be seeing you. Johnny. Well, Gloria, I thought you were tucked in for the night. I couldn't sleep, so I called your hotel. Oh? They told me that the bellboy had been murdered, that you were at the police station, so I came down here. Is there anything I can do? Not for Benito, I'm afraid. He was killed in your room? Yeah. You think he could have been killed by mistake? Mistake? You mean maybe I was supposed to be the target? Hey, it's a thought. Johnny, you're in trouble of some kind. I wish you'd tell me what it is. You're not just down here on a vacation. Speaking of vacations, Gloria, let's... Johnny, what is it? Keep looking straight ahead. There's somebody across the street in the shadows. He's tailing us. Oh. Can you see who it is? When he goes past that light, I'll be... Well, what do you know? My old friend Krauss again. You mean the man who came to your room and was looking for you on the beach? That's the boy. Funny how he always seems to pop up when I'm with you. Johnny, I tell you, I don't know Doesn't him. Doesn't matter right now. Come on. Turn into the alley here. Okay. Now keep going straight down this alley and out the other end. Go back to your hotel and I'll call you there later. I may be a while. What are you going to do? Wait for him. No, Johnny. Look, Gloria, don't give me any argument this time. Get going. After she was out of sight, I ducked into a doorway. Then I waited. Yeah, Krauss was following all right. I waited until he got right up to me. And I dove at him. You! That's right, me. Drop the gun. Drop it. Yeah, this time I'm ready for you, sweetheart. Funny thing about me, Krauss. I don't like guys working over me with a gun barrel ever. All right. Now you're going to tell me what this is all about. Why Look, you've been tailing me. Why you worked me over with a gun barrel in my room last night. I want to hear all about it. You know why. Talk. I said talk. You, you're not taking me back. Taking you back? I know you came down here after me, but I ain't going back. What are you talking about? I know what happens to a three-time loser. Three-time loser? You want me back home, you got to carry me. Hey, wait a minute. You ever hear of a man named Alvin Summers? Oh? 
How about Gloria Harris? No, no, no. You sure about that, Cross? <laughs> look, Doc. Look, I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you are. You're too punchy right now to give me a routine. Yeah, I think I get it. You're wanted in the States. You figured I was a cop and came down here to make a pinch. Brother, right now, I sure wish I was. I mean, you... No, I'm no cop. Uh, I guess I made a mistake. You sure did, Buster. Uh, oh, how are the feeling? Oh, no, no, not at all. I just love the feel of a gun barrel whipping across my face. Krauss, I got a nice little piece of advice for you. Next time, you better find out what the score is before you jump into the ball game. <laughs> I left him there in the alley and went back to my hotel. Then, just as I was about to open the door to my room, I heard someone moving around inside. I went quietly down to the end of the hall, out the window, then eased along the balcony back toward my room. Inside it was dark, but I could make out someone bent over my luggage, searching it. I edged across the room, slowly. Then I lunged. Ah! Hello, Gloria. Johnny Dollar. Yeah, remember me, sweetheart? Johnny, I didn't think... I'm the guy you were making the big pitch for. Dancing, moonlight on the beach, the complete routine. Oh, I gotta hand it to you, baby. That was real nice acting. No, it wasn't acting, Johnny. I meant it, all of it. Oh, sure, Gloria, sure. That's why I catch you here and searching my room. That's all part of the big romance, huh? I can explain. And that's just what you're gonna do. Hey, look, Gloria, one guy has already wound up dead on this deal. I've got a strong hunch I'm number two man on the list. And this baby I do not want. <laughs> Santo Tomas, Mexico. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Alvin Summers embezzlement of $75,000. Item 9, $17.60. Business entertainment for one Gloria Harris. Believe it or not, I wasn't going to put that item on the account because I figured it might just possibly be a private romance. But when I caught Gloria searching my hotel room, I knew she tied into the deal somehow. That she could give me information on Summer's whereabouts. Johnny, please. Oh, no. You're not leaving, Gloria. Not yet. I'm not trying to get away. I... Oh, it's the use. You'd never believe me. Why should I? You lied to me. I lied to you once. Only once. When I told you I'm here on a vacation. I'm not. Surprise. The truth is I'm stranded down here. Stranded? Oh, sure. That's why you're staying at the Playa del Mar, the most expensive hotel in town. I don't mean no money. I mean no passport. Oh. It's true. You got a cigarette, Johnny? Yeah, here. Thanks. Yeah. I've been stuck in this ratty town for four months now. Hoping every day that I could figure out some way or find somebody to help me get back to the States. How come you picked this town, assuming I believe you? Because I heard that fugitives from the States sometimes came here. I've been drifting around for a year from place to place. I guess I thought my luck had changed here, but it hasn't. How'd you lose your passport in the first place? I'll tell you if you really want to know, Johnny. Personally, I'd rather skip it. It's a long story, not a very pretty one, and it's all in the past. Let's just say I've made a mistake about a guy. Okay, Gloria, okay. But there's one little item you haven't told me, why you were searching my room just now. Because I was trying to find out something about you, Johnny. The reason why you're down here. Why? So maybe I could make a deal with you. Deal? You help me get a passport, and I'll help you. How can you help me? You're looking for Alvin Summers, aren't you? Oh, am I? Six months ago, he embezzled $75,000 up in the States and took off. Go on. You came down here to find him. You're an insurance investigator. Keep talking. That's all. That's it. Now maybe you wouldn't mind telling me how you know all of... Oh, sure. That report in my suitcase. In the picture. Alvin Summers, I know him. I can help you, Johnny. Where is he? First, I've got to know if you'll help me. The passport? The passport. Well, what do you expect me to do about that? In your business, Johnny, you must meet a lot of people, all kinds. Maybe one of them has an extra passport or two for a price, maybe. All right, I'll see what I can do. Is that the best you can say? That's the best. Take it or leave it. 
All right, I'll take it. I haven't any choice. Now, about Alvin Summers. I'll take you there, to Summers Place. Where is it? Down the beach, about a mile below town. Then into the jungle a little way. How come you know where it is? I met Alvin Summers a couple of months ago. Here in Santa Tomas? Yeah. I went there once for dinner. Okay, you take me there, Gloria. First, I'd better go up to the hotel and change. The country's pretty rough on clothes. Okay, I'll meet you at your hotel in half an hour. Johnny. Mm. I only lied to you about one thing. The reason I was down here. The rest of it I meant. Last night. On the terrace and on the beach. I meant all of it. Really, Johnny. And I mean this. You know, I'm kind of glad you told me that. See you in half an hour. I stayed there a while after she left, going over the case in my mind. Maybe she was telling me the truth. But whether she was or not, I had to follow up any lead I could find, because I was getting nowhere the way things were. Half an hour later, as I was starting out of my room to go pick her up, my phone rang. It was a long-distance call from the States. Fred Wilkins at Northeastern Fidelity, Johnny. Hi, Fred. Well, how's the fishing down there? Fishing? A matter of fact, it hasn't been so good so far, Fred. Ah, that's too bad, but I'll bet the swimming is all right, huh? Whoa there, what's eating you? I didn't send you down there for a vacation. Well, you got a great sense of humor. You should see this place vacation. Then what have you been doing down there? Well, what do you think I've been doing? I've been looking for whoever it was that telephoned you and said he had information on Alvin Summers. You couldn't have been looking very hard. He called me again this morning. He what? That's right. He wondered if I'd send anyone down there yet. Hey, look, Fred, this guy is not easy to find, believe me. And I think I know why. Obviously, somebody doesn't want him to talk, and that somebody could be Alvin Summers, about one jump behind him. Summers? You, you think he's around there? Could be. I'm leaving right now to find out. I've got a lead on where he lives. Uh, there's somebody at the door. I'll call you when I get anything. Do that. Brother, fishing Oh, Lieutenant Gomez. Uh, well, look, I'm in sort of a hurry right now. This will not take long. Okay. What is it, Lieutenant? Early this morning, one of my men found Senor Kraus in the alley. How is he feeling? He had been badly beaten. He would not tell us anything, but it was fairly obvious who had done this to him. So? So, the last time we talked, Senor Dollar, I warned you not to attempt to take the law into your own hands. Now listen, Gomez, if you think I'm going to take a pistol whipping like he gave me and not do anything about do it, you Do not gotta... misunderstand. I care nothing about Kraus personally or what happens to him. I'm thinking about something more important. For instance? You are looking for Alvin Summers, a man who quite obviously does not want to be found. So? So when you find him, it is quite possible that there will be trouble. Granted. But let's face a few facts, Lieutenant. You and your boys can't help me. You're in charge of the Santa Tomas Police Force, all two men. And I imagine you've got a few other things on your mind besides an ambassador from the States and an insurance investigator. That may so well that be means true. I've got to do it on my own. Very well, Senor Dollar. This morning I attended the funeral of Benito Inscanza, who was killed because he had information about Alvin Somers. If you find Summers and take the law into your own hands again, I fear I may have to attend another funeral. Yours. That's what I liked about Gomez. He was the cheerful type. Well, I picked up Gloria at her hotel and we headed for Summers' place. We walked down the beach about a mile below town. The beach kept narrowing as the jungle crowded closer and closer to the water. This place is in from the beach away. There's a little path pretty soon that leads in. You could walk right by it and never see it. Here it is. And that's just what we'll do. Hmm? Walk right by it. I don't want to lead anyone else here. There's nobody else on the beach. I'm not talking about the beach. That's a regular jungle in there. Twenty people could be watching us, so we'd never see them. Oh, I guess so. Okay. Now we'll go in here, then work our way back to the path. Brother, this is pretty thick in here. Yeah. Oh, you're walking through thick brush like this. You always feel like somebody's watching you. Imagination gets pretty strong sometimes. I think it's a little more than imagination. What do you mean? Stop a minute. Listen. I don't hear Shh. him. Johnny. Yeah, somebody's tailing us again. Look, 
Keep moving straight ahead. I'm going to circle and see if I can intercept him. All right, but be careful. Gloria moved on, and I started circling to the right. Every few seconds, I'd stop and listen. Yeah, he was still there. I pegged the direction of the sound and started edging toward it slowly. Then my foot caught on a bar. I scrambled to my feet and kept going in the same direction. There was a small clearing ahead. I reached it, stopped, and listened. Nothing. Whoever I was chasing seemed to know the country better than I did. He disappeared. I caught up with Gloria a couple of hundred yards farther along the trail. Any luck, Johnny? No. Whoever it is is pretty good at keeping out of sight. Are you sure it was a person? Might have been some kind of animal. Yeah, maybe. You can see a corner of Alvin Summer's hut from here. Past that big tree. Yeah, come on. And stay behind me. All right. If there's any trouble... You think there will be? Look, a guy who's this careful about hiding doesn't usually welcome visitors. Quiet now. No sign of life. Keep back against the wall. I'm going to open the door. Hmm. Okay, Gloria. Nobody home, huh? Nobody home. Well, he seems to have a pretty comfortable place here. You like to live in jungles. Hmm. Yeah. What? Looks like he hasn't been around for several days. Oh? The food in these cupboards, pretty moldy. Yeah, I guess they've cleared out. They? Uh Uh-huh. He and whoever was here with him. What makes you think someone was? For one thing, two sets of dirty dishes over there. Maybe he just wasn't neat. He'd have to have been awfully neat to use two toothbrushes and two kinds of toothpaste and two people have been eating at this table. See the crumbs? Maybe there's something around here that could give you a clue to where he might be now. Maybe. If he's still alive. What do you mean? You think he isn't? Oh, I don't know. But if somebody else was living here, too, it could mean he had a partner in this deal. And it's a funny thing about that kind of playmates. Sooner or later, they start quarreling about who's going to hold the marbles. $75,000 worth in this case. Johnny, if he is dead, that leaves you nowhere. Maybe not. Listen. What? Yeah. Sounds like our shadow is somewhere outside. Keep talking, Gloria. Normal tone. I'm going out the back way and see if I can spot him. Why don't you look around the hut, Johnny? Gloria kept up a line of patter while I slipped out the back door and into the brush. I listened. You want me to do anything? Nothing but the sound of Gloria's voice. He had to be somewhere near. But where? I worked my way around to the front of the cabin, still under cover. No sign. I kept on around the other side. Then as I started to climb over a fallen tree trunk, I saw a shadow out of the corner of my eye. Hold it. Don't turn around. The voice was behind me. I could see the rest of the shadow now. A hand with a gun. And I knew it was zeroed in on my backbone. I said, hold it. I'm holding. Drop your gun. Kick it backwards, quick. Hey, look, whoever you are... Don't turn around. And I can't even see you. You think I'd be kidding you at a time like this? Any move, any move at all, and it'll be your last. Santo Tomas, Mexico. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeastern Fidelity and Bonding, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an account of additional expenses during my investigation of the Alvin Summers embezzlement of $75,000. Item 12, two cents. Just what I figured my life was worth at the moment. Gloria Harris had taken me down the beach and into the jungle to show me the hut where Alvin Summers had been hiding out. There was no sign of him. But I heard a noise outside in the underbrush and went out to investigate. I didn't see a thing. But I felt something. A gun barrel pressing against the back of my neck. I want to talk to you, Dollar. You've got a quaint way of arranging a conversation, believe me. I could do better if you'd take away that gun. Johnny! Don't answer. Who's answering? Johnny! Wait. Well? Be in your hotel room in exactly one hour. Look, what's this all about? You're looking for Alvin Summers, aren't you? Oh, am I? Johnny, where are you? I've got some information about him for you. Let's have it now. Not now. I've got to talk to you alone. Be in your hotel room in town in an hour, understand? Look. Do as I say and be sure you're alone. Alone. Okay. Now, just keep looking straight ahead. Don't turn around and don't tell anyone about this. Anyone. Understand? You make it pretty clear. I'll be watching you, Dollar. You won't see me, but I'll see you. I can believe it, mister. 
Johnny, please. Johnny, where... Oh, here you are. Yeah, here I am. Why didn't you answer me? I came out here looking for a guy, remember? How am I going to find him if I start shouting at you? But I got worried when you didn't come back to the hut. Yeah. That noise you heard outside, did you see anything? No, I didn't see a thing. Johnny, didn't you find anything to give you a lead on where Summers might be? I don't know. But you said if I helped you find him, you'd see what you could do about getting me a passport back to the States. Yeah, sure. Come on, let's get out of here. It suits me fine. This place gives me the creeps, all these trees and vines. Broad daylight, but you can't see a thing. I know. My imagination's still working over time. I've got that feeling we're being watched again. Funny, isn't it? Yeah, real funny. We kept on toward the beach. Gloria was fidgeting because she thought somebody was watching us. I was fidgeting because I knew somebody was. And I had a strong hunch he was the man whose long-distance phone call to the States brought me down to Mexico in the first place. We got back to the beach. I took Gloria up to her hotel and went down to mine in town. As I crossed the lobby toward the stairway to the second floor, out popped a familiar face. Hello, Fred. Oh, Carson. Lieutenant Gomez let you out of jail, huh? Oh, now let's get one thing straight, friend. I never was actually in jail. Well, you're lucky. I've seen the jail. Huh? Oh, well, I, I just had to pay a fine, and that judge they got in this burg read me the riot act, but then they let me go. Well, good. So now it's back to selling zippers, huh? Sure is. And I'm behind schedule, too. Checking out right now, as a matter of fact. A lot of territory to cover. Like I always say, half, half the world... Half the world's waiting to get zipped up. Yeah, you told me. All right, Dad. Say, Dollar, mm. I'd like you to do me a favor. Oh, that little trouble I got into last night up at the Playa del Mar Hotel, I'd sure appreciate it if you'd keep quiet about it when you get back to the States. You mean you don't want anybody to know you got plastered, grabbed a serape, and did the fandango? Now, Dollar... I broke a guitar over the musician's head? Now, can't we just forget about that? Believe me, that? I had until you reminded me. Now, Carson, I'm reasonably sure we don't know the same people and won't be seeing each other again. I'd say the secret of your lurid past was pretty safe. Well, I sure hope so, friend. But about not seeing each other in the States, I was planning on looking you up. Goody. Yes, sir, I got a deal for you. Sorry, but I have all the zippers I can use at the moment. No, that's not what I mean, friend. I've been trying to get you into a cribbage game, remember? How can I forget? Well, instead, I'm going to look you up in the States and let you teach me to play gin rummy. How could I be so lucky? Oh, sorry, I think that's my phone. So long, Carson. I'll sure look you up back in the good old USA, friend. Hello? 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 Hmm. Keep your hands on the table. What? Oh, my shadow again. Anybody follow you? Not that I know of. You're early. I know. And I searched your room. That's become an old Santa Tomas custom. To make sure you really were Johnny Dollar. So now you know. What about it? You can turn around. I don't know. Maybe you'll tell me what... Wait a minute. A decent shave and you'd match that photo I have in my suitcase. Alvin Summers. Yeah. I'm Alvin Summers. I don't get it. I had you figured for the man who made that long-distance call to the States that tipped me off to come down here. You're right about that, too. You put the finger on yourself? If you want to call it that. Well, what happened? Your deal go sour on you, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sit down. Take it easy. Tell me about it. I'll turn on the overhead fan. Pretty stuffy in here. Dollar, that phone call you got just now... Hung up. Clerk downstairs must have rung the wrong room. Or somebody was checking to see if you were here. Could be... Okay, suppose you start from the top. What was that? Relax. What are you... Just one of the charming features of this room. Why? You turn on that big overhead fan, it slams the balcony door. Oh, well, turn it off, will you? I'm kind of edgy. Yeah, sure. You asked me if my deal had gone sour. It went very sour. Oh, I had it all figured out. I was planning it for a year. I was going to embezzle the 75000 and really live, live big. Yeah. Instead of that, I spent all my time hiding. Mexico City, Cuernavaca, Tampico, you name it, I was there. Always undercover, always hiding. Did you ever spend much time hiding, Dollar? No, not much. Oh, it's a great life, great. 
Every time somebody looks at you on the street, you're sure he's after you, tailing you. You wake up in the middle of the night, you see a shadow outside. It turns out to be just a bush, but you spend the rest of the night sweating. Finally, I, I, I just couldn't take it anymore. The rest of my life, that way... You know, Summers, a lot of guys figure that out before it's too late. Too bad you didn't. Yeah. So, finally, I phoned the bonding company long distance. I knew they'd send an investigator. They sent you... I, I thought if I could talk to someone like you, see what could be done. There's only one thing can be done at this point, Summers. Come back with me to the States. Bring back what's left of the money. Sixty thousand. That'll help. But you know there can't be any deal. Yeah, I, I guess I always knew that. Here, take the gun. Thanks. Now, what about the money? It's in a safe deposit box in Mexico City. Here. Here's the key. One thing I don't get, though, Summers. Yeah? You wanted me to contact. But you were sure playing hard to find. Well, I had to be careful. I got a look at you the first day you arrived. I wasn't sure you were the one, so I decided to come to your room that night. But then I saw somebody else coming here, so I gave up. Who was it? The bellboy. Benito? Hey... That'll be just before he got knifed. Oh, no. I wasn't the one who killed him, Dollar. I'm no killer. Just the fool who runs away with somebody else's money, remember? Anyway, I didn't have another chance to get to Idle today. I had to keep undercover so they wouldn't find me. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Who's they? (laughs) The man who arranged for me to come down here and the girl who was going to make it all worthwhile. The girl... Summers, don't... It's me, Johnny. Gloria! Hello, baby. Here, let me... Leave the gun right where it is, Johnny. Put that safe deposit key on the table. I guess you're calling them. Thanks. And it all adds up. You found out Summers here was planning to turn himself in. You didn't want that money to slip through your fingers. But Summers disappeared from his hideout. You couldn't find him, so you figured you'd let me find him for you. That's right. And it worked. And you're so right about that money. You think I'd give it up now? Gloria. Keep out of it, Alvin. If you want to go back and be a Boy Scout, that's your business. The money stays with me. Johnny. Yeah? This doesn't have to be the end of it for us. Oh. So now we get the pitch about making beautiful music, huh? I'm not kidding, Johnny. Sixty thousand's a lot of money. You know, you put on quite an act... Maybe I believed a little bit of it. But if I did, I quit the moment you walked through that door just now. Okay, Johnny, that's enough. I thought maybe you'd be smart, but if you won't, you leave me no choice. No, Gloria, don't. Gloria! (laughs) The balcony. Out on the balcony. Hold it! Carson. Stay right where you are, friend. Oh, shut up. She's dead. She crossed me. You and she were working against each other. She wanted me to lead her to Summers. You wanted to find him yourself. That's right. And Summers, you took a lot of finding. That's why you killed Benito the bellboy, to shut his mouth. Then you went up to the big hotel and clowned around so you'd get arrested and that way set up an alibi for the evening. I was pretty proud of that little idea, Dollar. And it's all worked out just the way I wanted it. You see, right from the start... I Carson was holding all the trumps. All they were made out of lead and I knew he was going to start dealing them any second. Then I remembered the overhead fan. The switch was right next to my elbow. The balcony door was open and Carson had his back to it. What are you doing? Just turning on the fan. I need some air. Can you blame me? Yeah. You're sweating, aren't you, Dollar? What's the matter? You losing your nerve? Well, it really doesn't matter. What the... The door slammed. Carlson whirled. And I knocked the lamp off the table. By the time I hit the floor, my gun was out. picked up the lamp and lit it again. Summers was crouched in a corner. Across the room, sitting on the floor, was Carson staring stupidly down at the red bullet hole in his side. I picked his gun up off the floor. Dollar! Summers, call the police station, Lieutenant Gomez. Yeah, all right. Help me, Dollar. It hurts. Yeah, it hurts, but not as much as it hurt Benito and Gloria. I, I... You finally got me into a game, didn't you, friend? And you lost... Expense account item 13, double the amount of item 1, 
$440. Transportation back to the States for Alvin Summers and me. And you know, I turned him over to the authorities as soon as we got back. That's the way he wanted it. Gloria? Well, once in a while I get to wondering if she really meant some of the things she told me. Not that it matters. Conclusion of report. Expense account total, $923. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, please, there'll be a new exciting story on Johnny Dollar beginning next Monday. Next week, the Valentine matter. And believe me, it's not the kind of Valentine you'd wish on even your worst enemy. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Robert Reif. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Virginia Gregg, Marvin Miller, Don Diamond, Tony Barrett, and Parley Bear. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. Welcome back. Well, a solid uh, serial overall. Uh, I did like a lot of things about this. Now, unless you think that because Carson was the villain that everything he said was a lie and evil, I want to assure you that Cribbage really is a good time. I did really like uh, Johnny's romance. Even though the woman turned out to be a femme fatale, it was pl really played well. And while you definitely had suspicions of her uh, throughout the story, it was still a, a bit of a turn when uh, she turned out uh, to be who she was. Virginia Gregg turns in a fine performance. I thought Carson was a really good uh, character as well. Uh, you didn't really know where he stood until the end of the serial. Much like with Gloria, you did have a sense that there might be something fishy with this guy, but you really couldn't tell for sure. And I really appreciated how he was good both as the buffoon as well as the menacing villain at the end. If there was anything in here that I really didn't uh, care that much for, it was uh, Lieutenant Gomez. Uh, because I, I definitely could see uh, Gomez making an appearance after uh, Benito is killed. However, his second appearance in the serial just feels like filler, because he didn't really accomplish or help a whole lot with the story. And as Johnny said, given the status of this as a small town, there's not a whole lot that we really could expect Gomez to be able to do. So that second appearance felt like they were kind of padding things out a bit. But other than that, I thought it was fine. Now we're going to take a listen to more of my interview with John Abbott, author of the Who is Johnny Dollar Matter. Uh, now, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk probably more specifically about the research and just the, and the various Johnny Dollars. Now, when did you first hear an episode of uh, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar? 
January the 2nd, 1999. Not that I you know, remember that, but uh, I was at home recovering from a broken ankle. I couldn't get out of bed, so I had the radio on. Uh, I decided to listen to the big broadcast on WAMU-FM in Washington, D.C. Uh, the host, uh, Ed Walker, uh, has a four-hour uh, old-time radio program on, and he played ep- the two 15-minute episodes of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. And I was hooked. Wow. Now, could you tell, you know, you talked about listening to all the programs, I imagine, uh, several times. Could you tell us uh, more about some of the research that went into the book? For example, one thing that is in there are uh, episode uh, breakdowns of uh, programs that aren't in circulation. How did you get uh, these details for the book? A friend of mine uh, advised me that the Thousand Oaks Library had a uh, a collection of scripts which had been given to it from uh, KNX Radio in Los Angeles. And so I made arrangements with the library to come out there, and I spent a week and wrote down everything that I could about every program that I knew about where they had a script and there was no electronic version of it available. That's why uh, a lot of the programs that are not available we know anything about because they have all of those scripts, and that's at the Thousand Oaks Library over there in California. Exactly. Thousand Oaks, California. Now, you, one thing that's in the book is you actually piece together like all this pretty extensive uh, biographical breakdown of uh, Johnny Dollar. It's about, for, it runs about nine pages um, covering things like his background and history and as well as sources of income how much of a challenge was that and given that there were so many writers on the series was there a lot of stuff that uh, kind of contradicted itself throughout the run of the series oh ab- absolutely uh again i got this information by listening writing listening writing trying to collate information put it into a logical fashion but i found out very soon that since there were so many writers uh and at the early stages there was no dedication to maintaining a contiguous storyline that you would have in uh, situations where in one story he says oh i've been a detective for 15 years and another story will come out and say, well, I just started five years ago. So, uh, you yeah, know, all of this stuff kind of, you know, worked its way into the book, his habits, his uh, uh, dedication to making sure that no trout went untempted, and uh, things like that. So, I wanted to go ahead and talk about reused and repurposed scripts. Uh, and you catalog these. This is one of the things that you did that's new to the second edition. And there, there's just so many scripts where they either, you know, reused a script from another series or expanded that. And uh, I think they probably did this more than any other. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about these reused scripts? Sure. Um, a lot of them where uh, you had an early version of Johnny Dollar that was uh, repurposed. Uh, a lot of the five-part Johnny Dollar series, if you listen to them, they're a 30-minute program that had been done earlier. And so you had uh, uh, Jack Johnstone, who was the uh, uh, director. He would go to uh, various different uh, writers. Most notably, he went to uh, E. Jack Newman, uh, who had written a lot of the early programs, and asked him, can, you know, can you give me a, a 45, 50 minute program? And so he did that under the nom de plume of uh, John Dawson. So yeah, it, it, were... you see John Dawson, that's really E. Jack Newman. Oh, yeah. 
and Les Crutchfield also did did uh, some of these expansions a bit, but he did, yes. he used his own name. Yes, and it uh, you know why they did that, uh, who knows? It could have been contractual reasons. It uh, could have been you know any one of a number of different reasons. But going beyond that, uh, there are a lot of programs that were either imported from other series, and I got a great deal of help with that uh, from my friend Stuart Wright, who was uh, an old-time radio researcher in uh, Boulder, Colorado. He and I uh, spent many hours on the phone going over you know, my, my list and his list to come back with all of the various different instances uh, where a program uh, started out was reused, was used somewhere else, rewritten somewhere else, and finally ended up as a Johnny Dollar program. Yeah, it, it's always you know quite a quite a process, and it, you know you you have scripts from Richard Diamond, Nightbeat, uh, several from Jeff Regan, and even an episode of Voyage of the Scarlet Queen. Mm-hmm. Um, so just a lot of episodes, and I'm glad you've got that in the book because. There was, I think he may have had a list online, but it was posted in a forum somewhere. So now with the book, we can really have that for reference to, you know, trace it back and uh, be able to track down the episodes and listen to them. Yeah, and, and uh, quite honestly, uh, I did that on some of these, and a lot of times... The story is there, but you really have to listen for it. Uh, I, I was listening to one of these. I forget which one it was. And it was like maybe five or six lines of dialogue that if you listen to it, oh, I see where that was used as part of something else in the other series. So they, it was not a word-for-word trans, transcription from one program to the next. They... Um, yeah, diddled with their their work a little bit, try and get the most out of it. Yeah, and weren't there somewhere like E. Jack Newman? He combined, you know, he had written one story for one series, one story for another series, and when he did the serials, he just kind of combined uh, elements of both plots. Oh yes, yes, yes. Uh, the um, there's a program that he wrote called the Baltimore Manor which was broadcast in uh, January of 53, and the Rochester Theft Matter, which was broadcast in uh, May of 53, those were combined together to form the Todd Matter, which was a five-part program broadcast in January of 1956. Okay, so we've been talking about the serials, and... uh, there really does seem to be an indication this was something CBS wanted to do because before Bob Bailey, Johnny Dollar, they tried a new Mr. Keene serialization, Mr. and Mrs. North serialization, and they did actually record um, record a pilot for a new Rocky Jordan serialization. But it was really Johnny Dollar that made it. What do you think made the uh, five-part serials uh, so successful? Uh, Three things. Excellent writing, excellent direction, and an excellent voice in the part of Bob Bailey. Uh, These these three factors, considering that Johnny Dollar had been off the air for like ten months uh, prior to the the first five-parter, uh, it was a series that uh, had a great deal of appeal. Uh, they brought it back. Uh, Jack Johnstone just changed the whole format of it, brought some continuity of character in. Bob Bailey was a great voice actor, finally, and uh, he was able to uh, infuse life and uh, dynamis- dynamicism uh, into the character. And the stories, you know, a lot of them had been recycled, but some of them were brand new. And as Jack Johnstone said one time in a Spurback interview, you have 50 minutes to develop character, story, and uh, you know you didn't have that 
in a 30-minute program where you would have maybe at most 20 minutes uh, by the time you had station breaks and intros and exits from the network. But having that additional time to develop the story, it made for a better listening experience. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think they also really did seem to have just, uh, you know, a pretty solid, stable, you know, this, you know, re- almost rep company feel of all of the supporting actors who, yes. you know, kept coming back to play all of these roles, which I think that, that also uh, contributed to the series, I think. Oh, yeah, I mean, you had your uh, your your CBS uh, West Coast actors and... Uh, Again, going back to a uh, uh, an interview that Jack Johnstone did, he said, I knew if I called on Virginia Gregg, she would deliver what I wanted. No question about it. All the other actors, he knew what they were capable of. He had heard them on other series. So, you know, when he needed somebody to be a heavy, well, he'd just th- flip through his Rolodex, get the voice that he wanted to hear, and they were there. And they all did an excellent job. More with John Abbott tomorrow. Again, you can get his book, The Who Is Johnny Dollar Matter, uh, the volume one, uh, which collects all of the on-air stories from 1949 through uh, 1956. And uh, the second volume, which collects all of the stories from 1956 to 1962, either as a paperback or as an ebook. We'll also send them uh, to you if you uh, donate to support the show. Uh, if, donation of $125 for uh, one volume or $240 for both volumes. $50 for uh, one volume of the Kindle book and $100 uh, for both volumes. Or with a donation of $100 or more, we'll happily send you the Johnny Dollar Anniversary T-shirt, which is also available for purchase at yourstruly.greatdetectives.net. All right, well, that will actually do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow as we celebrate the actual 70th anniversary of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar's first broadcast with an episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, with Charles Russell. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.